This is me. This is my beloved wife, Sylvia. This is Sylvia's idea of sailing. This is my dream of sailing and my hope of circumnavigating the globe as a retirement project in 2029. This is Sylvia's reaction to that idea. I am on a six-year quest to convince Sylvia that a circumnavigation is a wonderful adventure, but the clock is ticking, so join me as I search for the perfect yacht that Sylvia will love and get all your ladies to subscribe and cheer Sylvia on in the comments. Welcome back to Naval Gazing at Camp David. This week, we've got a special guest, Ramsey the Vigla. Hope you don't mind. This week's guest yacht is the smallest offering from a manufacturer that has established its reputation as the high quality builder among the traditional production yards with a comparatively strong focus on performance. We're talking, of course, about the Nautitec 40 Open. Today, we are going to, number one, review its specifications, pricing and layout against three similar new vessels. Number two, do a full tour asking, as always, what would Sylvia say? Number three, navel gaze at an innovation and or adjustment that might make life aboard easier. Number four, have a look at the used market for three to five year old pre-owned comparables. And number five, Finally, give it a Dave score and compare the result with all the previously reviewed yachts. Now all this fun will be sandwiched between a wine pairing from the same region as the guest yacht and a look at a favorite sample of art from the same region. Yachts, waves, ideas, wine and art. What a civilized way to spend 30 minutes. So let's get going. Starting high above Vancouver, Canada, we fly east across North America, across the Atlantic and across the continent to France's Mediterranean shores and the home of last time's yacht at the Katana Bali Yards. From here we fly further west across France to the yards of Nautitec. Finally we hop just south down the coast to Chateau Roussel and our wine pairing this week. Chateau Roussel Cru Bourgeois Côte de Bourg. In 1636, Chateau Roussel has acquired over the centuries an undeniable reputation, so much so that in the 19th century it became a pilot wine producing estate where the modernization of its wine stone storehouse was experimented with. In 1868, the ferret consecrated Chateau Roussel by classifying it as Premier Bourgeois, the highest distinction in the AOC. Vincent Lamater, a lover of fine vine and wine, eager to learn all the requirements and complexity, chose this terroir in order to take up a challenge. Since 1999, Vincent has been striving to restore the splendor and reputation that the vineyard had acquired in the past. Today, Chateau Roussel is once again a must for Bordeaux wines. Chateau Roussel Cru Bourgeau Côte de Bourg is 85% Merlot with the balance as Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc and Malbec. It's spicy with a peppery nose of plum, blackberry, comfit and minerals. The palate is fresh and well-defined with mouth-filling cassis and chocolate with licorice, mocha and vanilla spice. Oh, beautiful. Let's go have a look at that boat. Having a look at this boat, she is a handsome vessel with a very vertical or just slightly inverted bow. Nice lines to her. The cabin top is quite sculpted with that uh, attractive uh, counter color there in the dark gray. Um, good, good bridge clearance and overall, uh, you know, a very distinctive and refined look. Uh, I don't think you'd have any problem hopping on your tender driving away from this, looking back and seeing something you're extremely proud of. The, uh, the angularity of the windows and that cabin top are really quite sculpted, really very attractive from my perspective and huge hull side windows 
really is uh, quite a yacht, both on the outside and on the inside. Now, having a look at the new comparables, we're looking here at the Aventura 37, the Seacat 37, the Naughty Tech 40 Open, and the Dragonfly 40. And as we have a quick look at their upwind sail area, you can see the Aventura 37 is in the lead. Now, bearing in mind, though, that I always choose the standard sail configuration, which in the case of the Aventura is a, an overlapping jib and not a, a self-tacking jib. So the rest of them have a self-tacking jib and as such have uh, perceived lower upwind sail area. So Nonatech is doing quite well uh, at 91 square meters. Uh, the next one being the Dragonfly at 90 and then the Sea Cat at 37. Hopping onto the cabin top, uh, I struggled to find a single line drawing of showing you the cabin top. I got one with the Dragonfly. Uh, but you can see uh, in each case, uh, you've got quite extensive area for solar. Uh, the Aventura 37 has taken up a, a chunk of that with a very attractive um, uh, lounge on top of the uh, the bimini uh, of course with the dragonfly you, you don't have that kind of space very slim hull but you uh, certainly get it uh, in the performance as we look at the pricing here you can scan across and quickly see that the uh, aventura and the sea cat are tied there at about 200 and uh, sorry, the Aventura is 268,000, then the Sea Cat at 296,000, which, which is kind of surprising that they're so close. I guess there's trade offs there. The Sea Cat is a, a, an extremely well constructed, I would say, performance cruiser, if not performance yacht. Aventura has the, uh, the nod on usability and comfort. Uh, the Naughty Tech um, is the next at 406,000. So you're taking a $100,000 jump up to up there or almost 150 over the uh, Aventura. Um, but you can see, you know, again, a lot of really nice space, good trampoline areas. The hulls aren't too wide, so you're going to get decent performance. You know, it, it's a, a very nice sort of standard layout. Dragonfly 40 uh, with its retractable pontoons. I mean, it is uh, all business there. Hopping into the saloon, um, we can see here the Naughty Tech uh, has probably the largest saloon, although the Seacat 37 is probably a little deeper, not as wide. Um, the Aventura 37, actually, I'll take that back. I'm going to guess the Aventura 37 square footage there probably has the biggest saloon of the bunch. Um, then the Naughty Tech, then the Sea Cat uh, 37, and of course, finally the Dragonfly 40. Uh, with the Dragonfly doesn't do a bad job of it, it's just much more stretched out. So uh, try not to get uh, deceived by just the configuration that a trimaran has to have. Uh, looking at actual uh, weight here or dis uh, displacement, you've got uh, the Sea Cat surprisingly the lightest at 5 ton followed by the Dragonfly at 5.6. Um, then a real surprise, the Aventura at uh, 7.9, and the heaviest being the Naughty Tech 40 at 8.5. But you can see the sheer size of the Naughty Tech in these photos. Heading down into the cabins themselves, um, you can see uh, that the Naughty Tech uh, being the longest, um, also has the, the widest hulls. You can see where the performance on the Sea Cat is uh, going to do extremely well with those relatively slim hulls. Uh, surprisingly, the Aventura 37's config is quite slim as well. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the, uh, with the actual stat numbers here as we get into it. And speaking of which, Let's hop in and have a quick look at the numbers themselves here. So um, we've already looked at the top line. As you know, I always assume for a sail away about a 50% adder, so you can see it there. 
As we get into the, uh, the overall length, of course, the dragonfly is the longest. Um, as we uh, look at the draft, the dragonfly is also uh, the shallowest at uh, 7 meter. And then heading to displacement, we've already identified the sea cat is the lightest at 5 ton. Uh, upwind sail area on the Aventura is the greatest at 94, but if you factor in uh, uh, the fact that that is a, an overlapping Genoa slash jib, and the others are self-tacking jibs, uh, the nod would have to go to the Nauditec 40. Um, looking at tankage, uh, the Aventura uh, s takes it on average at 500 liters each um, with the Naughty Tech uh, at 400 on the fuel and 600 on the actual water. So it's a bit of a toss up. Looking at the actual quality and performance uh, forecast numbers here. As far as hull construction goes, uh, the CCAT uh, leads there with a foam core sandwich, uh, vacuum infused epoxy and vinyl ester resin, and a quadraxle e-glass. Uh, the next one is going to be the Dragonfly uh, with full vinyl ester on foam core. And uh, I would say the Naughty Tech and the Aventura are tied uh, with vacuum infusion vinyl um, and I'm sorry, I'm just reading this again. Aventura saying uh, vinyl ester and epoxy resins, uh, which the Naughty Tech doesn't have. So uh, we'd have to give the nod then to the Aventura 37. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and check all my figures on this because that really kind of surprises me. Uh, going to the sail area over displacement, uh, we have in the lead here the Sea Cat, which is a real surprise, beating out a, the Dragonfly, which is a trimaran at 28. Uh, next, again, Aventura is over the Naughty Tech. So Aventura is the 24 and uh, the Naughty Tech is 22. As we head to displacement uh, over length, this is where we're like golf, lowest number wins. Uh, we've got Sea Cat in the lead at 102, followed by the Dragonfly at 107, followed by the Naughty Tech at 140, with the, the Aventura uh, the heaviest at 169. Hopping on board, what would Sylvia say? Well, I think Sylvia would really like this yacht. The quality of the finish. Uh, the, the woods they use, everything is just a notch above the other production y yachts. The other thing I quite like about this, and it's a debatable point, is the positioning of the helms. I really like that the, the, they're well outboard, that they're well aft. Um, I can see out the side, I'm almost hanging over the edge like an ORC. Uh, I can see all the way up the bows, through the windows, I can see between my hulls on the back, both hulls easy for docking, and of course my sails for full sail trim control. As far as control, I love it. Exposure, obviously, you're very exposed. Heading up the side decks, you've got lots of room for solar. A little disappointed to see that it's not an integrated solar panel. Um, the uh, hatches are not recessed. Uh, I'm assuming Naughty Tech has their reasons for that. Uh, nice princess seats up here at the front. Let's do a little navel gazing. One of the big things that I find is uh, fenders and protecting your boat. It's a little brutal. Uh, there is a new fender company here called Impact Boat Fenders. And they're really quite innovative. Uh, they're uh, a, a flat format, so it's easy to, to deploy without rolling up or away. Um, it's easy to store. It's got rope or a strap attachment. It comes with a knotless fastening attachment and adjustment system that you're seeing here. Uh, kind of a cam uh, scenario with the actual uh, belt straps. Um, it has a, a wide array of shapes uh, for uses as standard fenders, uh, bendable fenders, long raft up fenders, 
and docking pads as well as piling pads. Uh, really quite a, a, an innovative product. Additional fun uses, of course, is that it's a, a floaty toy uh, and, uh, and a seat pad if necessary. Now here we're seeing the uh, rope attachments. They're using a, a very innovative clip for those of us who aren't uh, memorizing our knots. Now I know this may be uh, poo-pooed by most of the real sailors out there, but you know, if my daughters are on board, uh, this is a great thing. If our guests are on board and they're not uh, used to the, the competitive knot tying for your, um, for your fenders, uh, this is a great thing. You can engage uh, guests in the placement of the fenders and anybody can actually do it. So as I was saying, you've, you've got quite an array of fenders here. Uh, the flat and the bendable style fender. Uh, bendable, depending on the hull shape you have, uh, helps to keep it in place. Um, and then you've got fenders that have multiple grommets on it for either vertical or a horizontal positioning. And then these wonderful big long uh, raft up fenders that really protect the hull sides of the boats, both boats, as you raft it up. Uh, if you've got your own slip, you know, wherever that is, you can set up uh, on the pylons and as well as along the dock. And again, as I mentioned, great toys and great relaxation uh, tools as well. Okay, back on board, having a look around uh, the bow here. Um, you've got nice embedded steps there. You've got a full front cockpit with glass holders and a nice touch of teak. Um, again, there's these little touches that just make a Nautitech that much nicer. They've got the factory made uh, sun pads here that create sort of a, a, a relaxable back on these. I really do love the two-tone here. You know, stylistically, um, elements like that remind me of the Fountain Peugeots, but quality-wise, it feels a higher level once you get inside. Uh, you know, the underside of the canopy is beautifully done as opposed to the Fountain Peugeot, which kind of leave it just uh, sort of pseudo unfinished. Um, embedded uh, indirect lighting, an embedded um, window there so you can see up. Uh, I, I like um, the uh, uh, salon in here to a degree uh, with that table that can drop down. Um, you've got a step up into the settee, which gives you a nice visibility out. Let's head down into the owner's hall. You've got a nice little desk here. Everything feels, you know, extremely nicely finished. The inset leathers, uh, the, the different tonal colors, uh, the notch out at the bottom there. You know, it's a narrow hull. Uh, and, and you're not going to have full access up the side, but it's not bad. Um, your head here, I'm not a fan of where they placed that mini washer dryer, and I'm, I'm definitely not a fan of mini washer dryers. Again, it's a 40 foot. I have to keep reminding myself, this is a 40 foot. I'm not looking at a 44 or 46. So uh, I take back some of my comments on the mini washer dryer. I'm not going to be living aboard on a 40 foot. Uh, and they, they at least have a, a, a washer dryer on here. So it's, it's nicely done. Let's, let's head down into the passenger side, but first we're going to have a, a quick gander. Um, the uh, galley, nicely laid out. Again, I got to keep reminding myself, this is a 40 foot. Look at those embedded indirect lights. Nice detail on the steps heading down. You know how I love my steps. Um, and again, the woodwork, very well done. Look at the embedded lights, the, 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 the massive size of that window, the soft touch on the, on the wall panels. Nothing feels even moderately unfinished. This is a, a beautifully finished yacht. Um, and into the uh, head, you've got a, a pseudo dry head. <laughs> I suppose if you put a curtain there. Um, and nice touch of the, the, the teak uh, flooring in the shower, you noted that. Um, as we head back uh, to the um, VIP guest cabin, look at the size of the windows. You got really nice windows, all of that beautifully uh, embedded indirect lighting. Uh, I mean, they really have done a very nice job on all the details here. 
Um, let's swing around and head back up those lovely stairs. You've got your escape hatch there uh, and uh, good traction on all the stairs as, as we're heading up. Uh, the tones of the wood, floor, cabinetry, all feel extremely nice. The quality of this sliding door felt heavy and strong. Um, you can see you've got plenty of room in your galley. Uh, for the size of it, you've got a huge cockpit area, nice seating, beautiful teak table. Again, I, I put a, a high gloss on there. Let's step off and get you a little bit of a, a profile of this vessel. Again, she's a really handsome looking boat. Um, nothing that you wouldn't be fully proud of there. I really like the way they've extended that uh, canopy all the way back uh, and put a window in it. Okay, let's look at pre-owned comparables. Our first one here is a Lagoon 40 2020. So one year old, two year old boat. Um, we're looking at, at if you recall, a, an estimated sail away on the Naughty Tech. Uh, we take the base and we add 50%, so we're at about 610 US. Here we're looking at 567 for a two-year-old uh, Lagoon 40. Uh, I'd have to say I'd take the Naughty Tech. I I'd pay a wee bit more and I'd get the brand new Naughty Tech. Uh, I like the fit and finish. Yes, I'm going to have probably more space in the Lagoon, um, but I, I, I like the, the feeling within the Naughty Tech, that sense of a little elevated quality and you're probably your performance numbers are going to be better on the Naughty Tech. Next we'll move on to a Fountain Peugeot uh, Lucia 40. This is 2018 so a four-year-old boat. Again uh, we're comparing a new Naughty Tech at 610 to this at 380. Um, I would, depending on the condition of this boat, I'd have to look real hard at that Lucia for that price. Uh, we're into a 2019 Bali 4.1 um, and we're asking here, so we're a three-year-old boat, we're asking 400 grand versus the uh, 610. Uh, the, the, this Bali is probably going to be in great shape. The finishes aren't the same, but the Bali sheer space is going to be extraordinary. My guess is your, your hull construction is going to be about the same on both of them. Uh, I'll bet you your performance is about the same on both of them. Uh, I'd be tempted to go Bali on this one. Um, heading now to uh, a Naughty Tech, a uh, three-year-old Naughty Tech 40, uh, 475 versus 610. Um, I would go with the used Naughty Tech. Now, let's move into the area of heresy for most watching this channel and do a quick look at what you could get in an equivalent monohull. Uh, again, I add 20% to the length of the monohull to give you the same comparable uh, usable space, livable space. So if we're adding eight feet onto a 40, we're, at, we're looking at a 47 to a 49 foot monohull. So our first one is a 2021 Elan GT6, a 50 foot. Uh, so this is a, a one year old boat uh, and it's they're asking 586 versus our brand new boat at 610. Um, the space inside this Elan GT6 is, is, is ginormous. Uh, you have definitely more internal space, livable space, a full walk around uh, master berth, um, and uh, you got a nice swim deck that slides down. Cockpit space is going to be a little less. Overall, I'd do the Elan if I could convince um, Sylvia uh, re the healing. Uh, looking at a 2020 do 4, 530, so a 50-foot boat. Uh, two years old. We're comparing to 610 on the new Naughty Tech. This is 612. Um, it's a lot of boat. Uh, it's, it's relatively new. You're going to have some additional toys, uh, but it's a fair fight between them. Uh, it, it'd be a toss-up in my mind, uh, and I'd probably end up on the Naughty Tech. Um, the uh, 2019 Genoa Sun Odyssey 49, 490, a 49-foot boat. 
uh, we're looking three years old and we're looking at 435 versus 610 again a ginormous space inside this um, equivalent cockpit space um, I, even Sylvie would probably go for this just by the sheer space inside last but not least an 019 Beneteau Oceanus 46 uh, so we're looking a three-year-old boat 48 feet 410 grand that's a two hundred thousand dollar Delta um, it, it, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to go with the Beneteau. Okay, moving on to the Dave score. Where does our Naughty Tech 40 open end up? Well, she did very well. Um, you're looking at uh, interior uh, elegance. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, eight. Uh, the uh, in, uh, exterior elegance, we're looking at a seven. Interior comfort, simply because we're looking at a 40 foot yacht and, and my perspective is 48 to 52. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're crap for my application. So we're looking at a five for comfort uh, and an exterior comfort, six. Um, really nice cockpit, but you know, it, it's a full front cockpit and no um, elevated lounge, fly lounge. Uh, quality, I'd have to give it an 8. It really does feel like a very nicely made boat. Performance, I'm going to give it a 7. Uh, lazy Sailor, 7. Everything comes to the back there and it, it, it would be a comfortable boat to sail. You'd feel very in control of that. Um, condo, give it a 5. It's just not big enough to be classified as such. Uh, geek Score, give it a 6. There's nothing wild on this. And value for the money, I'd have to give it a 7. So there you have it. Uh, it sits right now on the Dave score, uh, tied with the FP42 uh, and just ahead of the Neil 47. And that, that one, that, that's debatable, again, for my application. Um, although I, I wouldn't have either of these for my application, they're just too small. Um, the uh, Lagoon 46 and Bali 4.6 and Naughty Tech 44, of course, uh, a notch up from there. For Art of the Region this week, we're looking at George Brock and his work, The Port of La Ciota, Spring 1907. George Brock's career started in 1900 when he went to Paris and worked as a house painter. As a result of his fr friendship with Raoul uh, Dufay and Orthon uh, Fries, both artists from Le Havre, Brock joined the Fauve movement in 1906. With Fries, Fries he travelled to Antwerp in 1906, to La Ciotat in 1907, and several times to Lestec. Brock's Fauve period proved transitory and his fauve work were relatively restrained. In the Paris version of La Ciotat, 1907, for example, the colors, though vivid, are not dazzling, and the brush strokes are applied in small rectangular units rather than in the broad, quick swatches used, for example, by Maurice Valmec. By 1908, Georges had developed a great admiration for the work of Paul Cézanne, whose influence is discernible in Brock's Houses at Le Sketch, painted in 1908. In this uh, proto-cubist painting, the sensuousness and relative abandon of Brock's fauve period were cast aside. The port of La Ciotat dating from spring 1907 typifies Brock's work in the south of France where the golden tonality in, uh, that distinguishes his palette throughout this period has already been heightened by his exposure to the southern light of La Sketch. In the, in the midi Barak also developed increasingly abstract technique allowing strokes and contours to gain an autonomous presence the result was a flat decorative quality that Baroque um, shared with uh, Frins. Although Frins' sin sinuous brushwork is more closely related to the graphic mannerisms of Art Nouveau. 
While Laporte manifests these elements, it is somewhat more naturalistic than Brock's more radical work from the mid-1907. The subject of the port is a common one. Both Brock and Fries painted many such harbour scenes in La Lesquet and La Ciotte. La Ciotte was a shipbuilding town and its small harbour was dominated by a large dry dock facility that appears in the background of the present picture where two steamers are, shot, are shown. In 1912, Georges Brock met Marcel Lapre, a professional model introduced to him by, of all people, Picasso. Brock married her in 1926. Well, that's everything for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, the wine, the art, and of course, the Nautitech 40 Open. Join me again next week as we look around at another way to see the entire globe. We'll see you then. Thanks so much. Cheers.